This is wonderful. Welcome to what I expect to be an outstanding discussion of future technologies for intelligence and national security with three leaders who help define the investments which are creating those futures, those who've been charged with leading the government's efforts to provide inventions and disruptive innovations necessary for our security, and with incisive observations from the revolutionary private sector. I'm Lewis Shepard. I'm an R&D executive with VMware, but I'm also, relevantly here, the vice chair of the AFSIA Intelligence Committee. And as the moderator, uh, I have uh, uh, just one other reminder, continuing education credits, but also questions. We will be taking audience questions via the note cards. You'll see index cards. You should have gotten some in your registration packet. They're on the seats here. Uh, if you have a question, write it down, pass it to the aisle. We'll have uh, staff members uh, circulating to collect them. You don't have to wait till the speakers are finished to go ahead and write your questions down, pass them in. We'll start taking them about halfway in. I will briefly introduce our uh, distinguished panelists uh, before they offer in turn five minutes or so a piece of introductory remarks. To my immediate left, since 2019, Dr. Catherine Marsh has been director at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, having previously served as deputy director of IARPA, leading high-risk, high-payoff research for intelligence advantage. Before that, she spent four years as the chief scientist of CIA's DS&T, having originally joined CIA in 2001. It's hard to believe. She also spent several years in industry R&D, uh, I enjoyed reading about uh, her team, the team she led, their feats in uh, putting lithium-ion battery technology on NASA's uh, Mars exploration rovers. Dr. Stephanie Tompkins is in her second year as director of the legendary DARPA, where she previously spent more than a decade from 2007 to 2018 in a variety of roles, including director of the Defense Sciences Office as DARPA's acting deputy director, Earlier in her career, she uh, spent a decade as a senior scientist and research executive in the private sector at SAIC. And even earlier, before earning her PhD, she spent five years as an Army intelligence officer. And third, Dr. Lisa Porter is our private sector representative on the panel as the co-founder and co-president of Logic Inc., a company providing high-end management, scientific, and technical consulting services and was previously the president of Teledyne Scientific and Imaging, but Lisa also, many people know, had significant time in government service as well. Most recently as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for R&E, where she shared responsibility, here comes a big number, for around $100 billion a year worth of R&D and prototyping activities across all of DOD. Before that, she served uh, as Executive Vice President of Incutel, Director of Incutel Labs. Before that, she was the very first uh, full-time IARPA director and a DARPA senior scientist. This is a small club of brilliant people and was also an Associate Administrator at NASA. Now, <clears throat> Lisa's doctorate is in Applied Physics. Stephanie's doctorate is in Geology. Catherine's doctorate is in Inorganic and Analytic Chemistry. Um, is very intimidating since I'm just an ABD dropout from a PhD program in poli-sci, of all things. So I'm going to shut up and turn the floor over to Dr. Marsh for her introductory remarks. Well, good morning. Thank you, Lewis. Um, and thanks to INSA for inviting me to be part of the panel. Uh, I'd really like to not only thank INSA for that, but for bringing us all together with other leaders from across the community to have these important discussions. Um, on matters that are impacting national security and intelligence. Now, more than ever, discovering and adopting innovative solutions that will help us grow and change the future, providing a competitive strategic advantage is really important to getting the advantage of our adversaries. And as he noted, that's what we do at IARPA. Um, and IARPA was originally stood up in the aftermath of 9-11, I literally got my call to come the morning after 9-11 and join the agency. So, uh, but we were stood up to anticipate unwarranted surprise and give the intelligence community that advantage. And in 
a couple of weeks now, on the 1st of October, we're actually going to celebrate our 15th anniversary. And so over that time, we've been incredibly busy changing the way we do technology and the way we do tradecraft in the intelligence community by bringing new tools to bear, by thinking about things differently, by taking risk, by in investing in innovative solutions to give new tools and capabilities to the community writ large. You know, separate from the uh, operational missions of any of the uh, specific agencies in the IC, we get to take that broader look. We get to invest in capabilities that can have multiple applications, such as facial recognition that's used by Homeland Security, FBI, as well as others in the IC. We look at advanced analytical techniques, um, natural language processing, and making investments in advancing quantum computing. Thanks to Lisa, we have been in uh, quantum computing since 2007 when IARPA stood up, and we're still in there today, making huge advances in stabilizing the fundamental qubit, which without which we're never going to have that next generation quantum computing, all right? But we can't afford just to only look at quantum computing as one of our efforts. We're working on uh, changing architectures with our brand new Agile program that's coming out. Uh, it's kicking off just this coming month. And that program is looking at novel architectures to handle the huge amount of data and information so we can do computing differently than we're doing it today. Right? So we're looking at doing paradigm shifting work. We're looking at how we can explore the possibility of using or studying misinformation, disinformation, but malinformation, and how does that uh, foster what we need to do for the intelligence community. So uh, we're really busy. We have a lot of programs that we've kicked off and that we're continuing to kick off. And you will see a lot of new activities, both in our collections uh, sphere, where we're going after a uh, new ability to uh, to find space debris, to protect our satellites, because that can have a really detrimental effect on overhead systems, as well as finding advanced uh, tools to be able to determine whether we've got cyber actors uh, influencing what we're doing on our computing systems. I think busy is the best way to describe what's going on at IARPA right now. Uh, but most importantly, what undermines all of the approaches that we're taking is the willingness to take on risk, to know that things are going to fail. Everything that we do cannot work. That means we're not taking enough risk. We are doing out-of-the-box approaches that give us that next generation capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thomas. Hi. Good morning, everybody. And I, I echo Catherine's thanks uh, to INSA and to my fellow panelists and to you, Lewis, for taking this on. <laughs> so, you know, for me, the future is very, very bright with technology opportunities. It's also fraught with uh, risk, especially when you consider how much um, technology has been democ democratized in the past decade or so. So at the same time that we are moving as quickly as we possibly can to leap ahead, we've also um, got a lot of adversaries working at multiple scales who have access to tools they've never had before. So we're not simply worrying about nation state level investment the way we were at the time of, say, you know, the invention of radar or the invention of um, atomic weapons. But we're thinking about the full range of things that can happen um, against our national security ranging from nuclear weapons down to, say, ransomware that someone can, can create in their, um, their private office or tools that can be 3D printed in someone's garage. So I think that the, you know, the first point I want to make is simply that we live in a very, very uncertain, very volatile and very fra fragile um, kind of world at this moment with a lot of people um, particularly angry and grieving and not necessarily at their most rational. Um, that, makes, that makes those of us who are trying to anticipate surprise and to create surprise have a particularly challenging and, and very, very exciting job. So, so let me just start by saying that, you know, um, DARPA has a unique role in a very strong, or in what needs to be a very strong science and technology ecosystem. 
So the ecosystem is everything from universities and industry, other government labs and agencies, National Science Foundation, National Institutes for Health, other Department of Defense funders, all of the federal government and state funding agencies and philanthropists and, and investors. This is a, it's a really exciting and dynamic place. But collectively, that ecosystem has a tendency to move technology forward in very steady steps. I'm grateful for that. Um, because when organizations like IARPA and DARPA fail, we really want that technology to keep moving very slowly and incrementally forward. But what we, what we have are organizations now that have the opportunity to be the disruptors. So we are the ones who, when we are successful, we change everything. Hopefully we change everything for the good. I think our, rec our track record is great on that. Um, but, you know, as I said, we live in a complex world. So some of the things that DARPA um, is best known for are, would include um, the invention of material science as a discipline, which has led to all kinds of amazing benefits to society. Um, the Saturn V rocket, which took humans to the moon for the first time. A little experiment called the ARPANET, which grew up and graduated to become the internet. And that's one of those, that's one of those areas where, you know, I think the balance is still that, that all, of those all of the internet has been for the good, but it's certainly fraught. Um, with not so good as well, and we're spending a lot of our time trying to, um, to get ahead of and, and mitigate some of that. Um, stealth aircraft, um, it, you know, the, the timeline, we have just come from a DARPA conference where we have a timeline. It takes a, a fairly large wall to put all of the things on there. Uh, maybe relevant today, I would also point out the Javelin missile, which has been instrumental um, in Ukraine. And um, my favorite one, which, I'll, which I'll, I'll stop talking about the past, but my, my current favorite which is really important to the fact that all of us can be here in this room today, is an investment we made about a decade ago when one of our program managers said, making vaccines is just too slow and our war fighters are fa facing diseases all around the world. We need a better way. And he started a program to try to create that better way, introduced the rest of us to something called mRNA vaccines and made investments in a little company that you might have heard of called Moderna. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's actually, oh, I love to talk about DARPA, and of course we love to talk about the things that we've done, but the reality is DARPA is an agency that's entirely focused on looking forward. So most of our program managers couldn't care less about what we've done. They only care about what they're trying to do to change the world. So to, just to give you a little bit of a sense, we have about uh, 250 active pro programs at any one time. I have 90 program managers racing against a clock. That clock ticks for about four years. They come in, they have access to a $4 billion discretionary budget, and they're told that they can change the world. But they only have four years to get it done. And so they, they work with an incredible sense of urgency. They have vast creativity. I can't, I, I would use up all my time just trying to name the range of disciplines that they work in. Um, but every single one of them um, is focused on, on making that disruptive change. A lot of those programs will fail. Um, a lot of, I completely agree with Catherine, a lot of those programs must fail because if they don't, it means that we're not trying hard enough and we have just settled for being back in the middle of the pack in that steady state ecosystem. Um, currently, uh, I'm gonna, again, I can, I can list all of them. I'm just gonna give you a few highlights of the kinds of things they are working on today. Um, some of them are obvious. Of course, they are working on hypersonic um, offensive and defensive capabilities. Of course, they're working on microelectronics. Um, about four years ago, when the world was starting to get a little frantic about both the offshoring of the micro microelectronics industry and the fact that uh, Moore's Law, um, which has for decades improved uh, our processing capabilities in, uh, in sort of the semiconductor uh, integrated circuit domain, was starting to flatten. We made an investment in something called the Electronics Resurgence Initiative number of really fascinating breakthroughs and what could be done to keep that curve just on, a, on an endless trajectory. We're now investing and getting ready to kick off um, Electronics Resurgence Initiative, ERI 2.0, where we focus on how you make those breakthroughs scalable, practical, and operational in the real world. We're really concerned about supply chains and have got multiple programs started in that space. It's one that I think DARPA PMs have been thinking about for decades, but have always gotten a little bit distracted by the sexier, um, more fascinating opportunities in the worlds of aircraft and, and uh, um, new kinds of sensing systems and things like that. But we're doubling down. I think all of you would sympathize with why we, we might care about that. Um, and we're actually doing a lot of innovation in business as well. 
and uh, understanding that as the world has changed really quickly, we need to, to con continuously re-examine ourselves and figure out how we can move more quickly, get to answers more quickly, and actually transition our technologies um, as quickly as possible. So um, I'm going to take advantage of the stage to, to offer one shameless plug. Uh, so you know, DARPA can only operate with, with this entire ecosystem. And you know, I talked about the fact that we bring our program managers in for short periods of time. We're constantly bringing new people in. We need new ideas. We don't sit in a little circle and sort of invent stuff you know, at, in, inside a building. We do it by connecting with people everywhere. So if you have ideas, if you, if you think you know what the next great DARPA program should be, I, I really want to ask you to come and, and talk to us. All of us are waiting to listen. I just came from the second of six uh, DARPA conferences that we're hosting this year. I was, just came out of uh, Washington State, previously was in Colorado, and between now and December, we will be in Ohio, Georgia, Texas, and California. Um, come join us at one of those events, get a sense of, of what it's like to be fully immersed in the DARPA conversation, and uh, as I said, talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Porter. Wow. Um, so first of all, I just want to say how cool it is for me to be sitting up here. People ask me sometimes, you know, I've done a lot of different jobs. I, I can't hold one, you know, steady job for too long. Um, what are my favorite jobs? And it's very hard to answer that. But I will say that, as, as Catherine was talking about, the call from 9-11, that happened to me as well. I always said growing up I was never going to work in the government and then 9-11 happened. I think that happened for many of us. And so I went to work for DARPA. That was my first government job uh, back you know, right after 9-11, and then, of course, um, getting to start IARPA and seeing Catherine continue the, the principles that are so valuable that you've just heard them talk about. It's funny to hear IARPA and DARPA together, right, because it's a very consistent message about the openness and the transparency that both of those organizations really try to engender with the, with the community. Um, and so I would just sort of foot stomp some of the points they were making about, for those of you in the private sector, they try to make it as easy as possible to reach them. Um, they have websites that are extremely informative, frankly, and, and they have all these DARPA forward activities. IARPA has a variety of activities. So even though I don't work there anymore, I still feel, um, you know, I guess a, a certain protection toward you guys or a certain uh, cheerleading role here. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize, emphasize that. In, in my role up here today as, as um, somebody who after that went to a job that I can't list as my top favorite job in, in some respects, <laughs> but it was a very, it was a very important job. I, I don't mean to trivialize it as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. Um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, for research and engineering that that role was a new role, role that was created um, under, under um, Congress is guidance about the, elevating the importance of R&E. That's why USD R&E was created. Uh, it was purposeful to separate it out from the old ATNL, um, not to diminish the importance of acquisition, but to increase the importance of R&E in terms of how people thought about uh, developing programs that deliver mission value um, to our warfighters. And I bring that up because you, you heard pieces just from uh, Stephanie and, and Catherine. Um, about the complexity of the world that we face. And, and this, this view that, I've, that I have, I, I have to confess, I've always had it, but it was really emphasized in my prior role in, in the Pentagon. People often think that innovative technology, you know, for mission applications, they immediately go to the shiny object. They talk about quantum, they talk about meta, they talk about, you know, AI, whatever it is. And they, they, they fixate on a particular element of the bigger picture, and they say, if only we had AI, we would solve all the world's problems, um, as an example. And, and there is a lack of true system thinking that is, that is of concern to me from the prior job I was just in um, that we've really got to get back to, because without true system engineering, none of these capabilities that we talk about are actually going to have the effect that we want them to have. Um, we, we really, as a nation, have historic, we invented system engineering. This country invented it 50-ish, 60-ish years ago. Um, it is still an evolving discipline. It is not mature. It is not over. There are things we still have to learn how to do better. And one of the things that, as a community, we need to focus on is designing for resilience. So especially in complex systems, right? So um, I think both Stephanie and um, Catherine hinted at this, but it's extraordinarily important when we talk about operating in the complex world and the complex environment in which we reside, 
that our goal has to be about not retreating away from that, not thinking that we're just going to wish that away, but rather to embrace it and say, how do we operate much more resiliently? How do we design for resilience? I emphasize this word because ironically, for those of you who are in the cyber community, and I know there are some of you who are experts in that domain, um, the cyber community has, providing, has been providing the thought leadership in this area uh, over the past few years, mainly because they learned the hard way um, that focusing on building secure, perfect, or what they call trusted systems was, was a wrong focus. It was actually a goal that led to significant um, failures, and, and we can sit up here and recite those all day long, and we won't. Um, but I think those of you in that community are well aware that a pivot has occurred in the thinking about how we approach complex cyber systems. Um, and the focus now being on resilience, or what some people would call, I would call, a zero trust philosophy, where you accept the reality that things are dirty and messy and bad guys are going to be on your systems and they're going to be in your presence and they're always going to be trying to take you down. Uh, you need to adopt an approach that allows you to operate through. Um, that's what resilience is fundamentally about. Now, system engineers would look at me and say, yeah, we learned that many years ago when we learned how to design complex systems that weren't brittle. Um, and that's true, but we have to remember that as we go forward and we're merging different disciplines for which system engineering is still a novel concept. Um, and AI would be one of those domains, I would argue. Um, I do want to mention, I actually was reading some excellent articles going back and forth on, on new edicts coming out from the government with regard to cybersecurity. When we talk about zero trust or we talk about resilience, we are absolutely not talking about risk avoidance. Um, risk management is not risk avoidance. It's about understanding your risks, continually monitoring and measuring your system, providing a feedback loop, and enabling the management of those risks according to a risk profile that is accept acceptable to you for your particular mission. So if we try to get to zero risk, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to end up in a bureaucratic morass. Um, and speed has always been one of our greatest advantages as a country. So we, we really need to embrace the concept of risk mitigation versus risk avoidance. This may sound, again, obvious to those of you who are engineers. It turns out it's not so obvious to policy wonks and politicians. I've lived this. That's why I can say this with authority. They like the easy button, and I can't tell you how many times they say, Lisa, just tell me how much money it will cost me, and I'm happy to spend it to make this secure. And so there, there is no answer to that question. It, infinite money will not make you secure, right? That is not the right question to ask. Now, this extends beyond cyber networks, where people are starting to get it. It extends into microelectronics, and it extends into supply chain. Supply chain is ultimately a very complex system. And while efforts to onshore have some value, particularly in enhancing our capability as a manufacturing nation, they are not going to solve this problem because with 5% of the global population, we aren't onshoring everything. Sorry, newsflash. So we need to get over this notion that we can isolate ourselves, that we can focus on just doing everything internally because we don't have enough people in this country and we don't have enough resources and geography and all that other stuff to do everything that we want to do and be a global power. We need to understand that the global networking of our supply chains is not going away, but we need to look at it with a different lens and that's a lens of resilience and zero trust. We need to work with our, with our allies, our partners and allies and say how do we collectively build resilience into our supply chains. So that would be a perspective that I wanted to introduce. It's informed by watching things from the r &E, the bigger r &E picture, and being in the Pentagon and seeing some interesting, if not, uh, I would say, dangerous approaches to trying to just press an easy button and make everything work right. It doesn't work that way. Engineers need to speak up, especially system engineers, and say, no, our focus has to be on resilience. This is how we will bring to bear our greatest technologies uh, to solve these complex problems in a way that allows us to continue to prevail. And, and that's obviously the objective here. So with that, I will turn it back to Lewis. Well, you, you've, you've teed up an immediate question um, on many questions. And we have many questions from the audience. Thank you. And we'll get to those. But what I'm going to do is ask um, a, a single uh, question shaped in some way by uh, what you've each just said. Uh, coming down this way again, one to each of you, and then each can opine on this. 
Uh, Lisa, you brought up um, system engineering, and you mentioned AI. Uh, we had an interesting comment yesterday from Admiral Trussler, uh, head of Naval Intelligence in 2 and 6, um, where he spoke of his frustration with constantly being um, um, assaulted, as he said, uh, by um, uh, vendors describing the value of AI. And he said he, even his own personnel, his own uh, technologist, telling him, you know, AI is the solution to this, AI is the solution to that. And in his mind, he fears it becoming just a buzzword. Uh, now, often system engineering is a great approach to combat that. Um, I know that uh, in industry, uh, there are huge efforts uh, in, in sort of the, the other side of industry, uh, where you have uh, Google's R&D budget, Microsoft's R&D budget, Amazon and AWS R&D budget, Apple R&D budget. Uh, if you take the top 10 tech companies' investments just in what they label as ML or AI, that's, that's about $100 billion a year. Uh, is that a source for the kind of system engineering on AI? Where, where do you see the system engineering, that kind of rigor and foundational approach coming uh, for what we need for national security in AI? Fantastic question. Um, and I feel confident answering this because I, I know that uh, Stephanie and her, her deputy who just departed, Peter Heinem, um, also feel very strongly about this. And so I would answer, frankly, DARPA and IARPA will be, I think, great sources of providing that focus. Um, you know, the, the, the distinction between the national security arena and let's say a Google, not to pick on Google, but just because they're so big, um, is that when we talk about mission critical, we have a situation of high consequence with failure, right? So AI is simply not going to be applied in mission critical systems until we develop far more rigor around how we, how we use it and how we place it into our systems. Um, so the, the word AI engineering is, or the phrase I should say, AI, AI engineering is now becoming real. And I will say, in fact, Dr. Fisher, who works for Dr. Tompkins, um, uh, she runs uh, I2O now, is that correct? Yes. She has talked about AI engineering. Again, Dr. Heinem talked about it. This is, this is something where people are now in the, it's now be developing a consciousness, of, if you will, within the community, a recognition of some of the real failings of the current state of the art. And I don't have time to go into it, um, other than to say those of you who are knowledgeable enough about AI are, are very well aware of its frailty so far. Um, and it, it, it ties to a lack of engineering approach and system engineering approach. Uh, consistency among uh, how we think about data, how we, how we label it, how we store it, how we source it, uh, the standards of exchange of data and formats. Um, it, it ties to um, how we think about T&E. Mm -hmm. how, how is that actually done? To include the sustainment challenge um, as you have drift over time, how are you updating models? The, these things are all done in sort of a black box, uh, where they're, they're, therefore people are, are expected to just believe results. And by the way, without reproducibility of results, I don't know how anybody really is going to to take on AI into mission critical systems. I mean, quite frankly, and again, no, no offense to the commercial sector, if you give me a bad movie recommendation, it's really not the end of the day. Like, that's a first world problem, right? Um, our, our DOD and our IC have a much higher threshold for, for requiring and being able to depend on AI. Um, if you'll indulge me for one more minute, Lewis, I did want to make a point from the DOD perspective um, it, this, this notion of pushing on AI engineering, it's not a nice to have. It is absolutely essential because, because we need this capability. And I, and I want to give you a specific example that I became more appreciative of in my most recent role. Um, and, and Stephanie touched on hypersonic offense and defense. Um, Hypersonic defense is a problem we don't actually know how to solve yet. We are working on it, of course. But when people think about it, they usually think about the, the thing you're going to fire, right, the shooter. How am I going to shoot at the hypersonic missile? The challenge we have to recognize is the timelines of hypersonics are such that the command and control aspect of this is fundamentally different than we, the way we think about missile defense today. And this hasn't totally seeped into the consciousness yet of everyone. 
The Space Development Agency recognized this, and one of the drivers for standing up SDA was, in fact, to address the hypersonic threat and the recognition that we needed uh, persistent surveillance, but also that we need to figure out how to use AI and ML to autonomously fuse, tip, and cue directly from sensor to shooter. This is not what we do today. But, but if we don't figure out how to do this, we can't counter the hypersonic threat. The timelines will not allow us to have centralized command with guys on console somewhere um, in, the, in the traditional way we think about missile defense. This is a fundamental point that I think people need to, to really grasp because the hypersonic threat is real in the Western Pacific. It is a real issue and we need, to, we need to get after that. And that's why DARPA is in fact focusing on these problems. But I wanted to give you the bigger context of why this matters. AI engineering is not a nice to have, it is a must have because we do have to figure out how to autonomously uh, fuse tip Q and get from sensor to shooter. And do it, by the way, in a decentralized manner where it's different sensors with different viewing angles figuring out what gets fused where, this is a colossally hard problem. Um, so I just raised that sort of to incentivize, if you will, why this matters. And you notice I didn't use the word quantum once. <laughs> Dr. Tompkins, thoughts on that? The, particularly the, the rigorous engineering aspect? Um, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think that uh, the one thing I think I worry a little bit about still in the world of AI um, has to do with the way that we frame it. So we think of AI as coming in waves, and the first wave of AI was um, basically decision trees. It was very rule-based. If you think about how TurboTax works, that's the first wave. Second wave is statistically driven, and that means you know it's taking advantage of big data, but it is basically the machine learning, deep learning methodology that we're talking about today. Um, where most DARPA AI-focused programs, so we have programs that both use AI where we're, we're just taking advantage of what's available, but we have a lot of programs that are exclusively focused on developing AI, and we're looking at the third wave. And that's where you bring those first and second waves together. I worry a little bit in the sense that a lot of folks are still trapped in this notion that the second wave is all we need, and their fundamental lack of understanding of how that works, the hidden biases and the hidden gotchas, and the real ease with which it can still be spoofed is not yet fully solved. So I completely support the fact that we need to move into much more rigorous engineering, and people should be doing that today, but with, with some skepticism about exactly how, how magical that AI pixie dust really could be, while we are continuing to push as quickly as we can on solving the problems that turn it into that much more comprehensive discipline. My sense is that we need that third wave to mature, and I think we're all working on it as quickly as possible to get there. Fair enough? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Marsh? So, absolutely agree with what you want to do um, and why we need to do it. Reality is for us, we, we don't have programs focused necessarily on AI, but we, AI is used in so many things that we are doing, right? We have to get smart about that because the volume, velocity, speed of data coming in, we can't afford to bring everything back anymore, right? We need to be smart about what we bring back, and so we need to rely upon artificial intelligence and what we bring back to ask the right questions. But we've got to do that smartly and with rigor and not build biases into what we're doing. It, it is amazing how important those data sets are, right? You cannot do it without well-labeled, specified data, and doing that without building the bias into it is really remarkably difficult, right? And so how do you find that? How do you get ahead of that? And so that goes back to that systems engineering that she's talking about, is you've got to look at the wholeness of what you're doing to be able to know where you want to input the artificial intelligence and the machine learning aspects of this to make it work effectively, right? It's not going to be perfect perfect ever, but for mission critical systems, we have to know what it is that we can enable with that and what it is we're never going to enable, right? And, and that's, that's, you know, when we're talking about making decisions that ultimately can 
uh, result in uh, life or death, um, we have to know that we have confidence in what it is we're doing. Um, it really doesn't matter in the private sector some of the questions that they ask because they don't have that same kind of consequence. And so that's where we have such an important mission in doing this is we have to build that that confidence in uh, to that, and that is something that the private sector doesn't necessarily need to worry about, and that's where our role is in our organizations, is to drive that and understand it. It's not just know it, it's understand it and then teach the world about it so that those who need to use it can, right? So I think that's important. Every answer sparks a new question in my mind, but we also, we have a lot of great, uh, audience question, so I'm going to uh, go to Stephanie with a, a kind of blended one. Um, you mentioned mRNA and uh, the, the decade-long payoff of that. Um, <clears throat> we had a question about uh, both IARPA and DARPA's uh, um, uh, positioning on TRL sweet spots, and uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of companies who are uh, offering COT software, and there's a, a, a kind of uh, um, a distinction there, obviously. but um, a word I've heard you use, uh, Dr. Tompkins, uh, is acceleration and DARPA acceleration. And just the notion of DARPA forward as a, a mantra uh, really drives that. Uh, we all think of DARPA as working on five to 10 year projects. Do your projects become more audacious as the rapidity of, of innovation uh, decreases, I mean, or increases the rapidity? Are you taking on more over the same kind of timeline, or are you doing things in faster spin-outs and rollouts? Where's that? So, so um, to, to say the official DARPA thing, I don't think there's any change in the audacity of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the timeline might vary, but the audacity sort of scales with what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, when you think about acceleration, there's two different answers from, from DARPA. One is just that core DARPA mission. And I talked about that already. We have a lot of processes built into DARPA to ensure that we move quickly. You know, every time someone gets comfortable, they get kicked back out and someone else comes in. We have the, the, the ticking clock. We have this sense that we have a very, very mm -hmm. um, minimal amount of time in which to accomplish significant impact. But there are also things that we do to adapt that are much more tactical and they focus on, you know, kind of the situations of the day. Um, and we are, I mentioned earlier that we're investing a lot in kind of business-focused programs, so things that will accelerate how we do our own work. Um, we just announced one yesterday, um, and this is, this is predicated on the idea that some of the best in, in ideas out there are ones we have never heard because the people who have them have significant barriers to being able to talk to us. So we just announced a new initiative called Bridges, which is focused on commercial companies, small businesses who don't have clearances, don't have classified facilities, and finding sort of a, almost a demilitarized zone in which they can actually gain entry, work with us, and if their ideas demonstrate the potential for the sort of DARPA level audacity, we handle getting them to the, to the next step so that they can then fully enter um, that community. We, are, we have a program called the Embedded Entrepreneurship Initiative, which is focused on the realization that a lot more of our, our technologies nowadays will reach the DOD through commercial means rather than by large programs of record. Um, and we had significant concerns that if you simply fund DARPA programs and assume that startups are gonna somehow get them mature enough, um, that, that, that just doesn't work very well. And in, one of the reasons it doesn't work well in today's world is that a lot of our adversaries have a much lower threshold for their willingness to invest in new technology. And we were not crazy about the idea of finding that a DARPA-funded technology was now had all of its IP owned by the Chinese government. And we were thus unable to take advantage of it. And so the Embedded Entrepreneurship Program focuses on getting DARPA and DOD-funded technologies through these small companies into a level of sort of business plan maturity that they're attractive to US and allied investors. And our pilot program in that area was immensely successful. Um, we're now wor working our way up. We started off with 30 companies. We're looking at a target of 150. Um, my goal is to get to a half a billion dollars in, in US investment. My commercial commercialization director says it's a billion at least, and she's confident she can get there, so there's, there's a little bit of your audacity. So there's a lot of things like that. 
um, going on, but uh, just a couple of examples. Yeah. That's great. You actually answered several audience questions in the course of that cool. answer. Uh, all right. Um, let's go. Do you have any, any thoughts on that, uh, either of the other panelists, on her? All right, then we'll go right next to the next one. Okay, okay I, I have an IARPA focused question. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, I hear a lot of bureaucrats call it miss dis or dismiss, mm -hmm. but you also mentioned malinformation, mm -hmm. and they're each different. Uh, this is an enormous challenge. We have a competing session. Looks like we got the, the bulk of, uh, we have standing room only here. There are some empty seats down front. Um, uh, a competing program on uh, the uh, upcoming midterms and uh, election safety and security. Um, but uh, what, what's the IARPA piece of this? When many people think of the intelligence advanced research, they do think of cognitive and mm -hmm. NLP approaches and things that have been analytically supportive. But um, where does the advanced research on that, what are the uh, early applicable practical approaches that might be spin out technologies? Good question. But the reality is that you're, you are correct. Misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation are very different, right? Misinformation, I made a mistake. Disinformation, I am telling you something that is just not right, okay? And, uh, or, but malinformation is factual with a spin, right? And factual with a spin can be incredibly dangerous, particularly in the intelligence community. And, you know, we are, are looking at uh, starting. We haven't started it yet because your question is where do you go? And we don't know yet because what are the right data sets? What are the things that are bringing that bias in there? What are the things that we can, can give us that advanced awareness of? The intelligence community has been in the misinformation and disinformation um, uh, business, if you will, for a long, long time. But this other piece has really become uh, out there and uh, pervasive, uh, the, the malinformation that is causing challenges for the community writ large. And so finding and developing the quality data sets that are labeled appropriately to be able to give us some of that real world influence, um, being able to look at what besides advertising and impressions, what kinds of language influencers, um, and how do you do that with a with a rigorous experimental design, right? Mm -hmm. And to show then that there, the results ultimately mean something because you're, just collecting data isn't enough. It's like, what's the impact of that and being able to then know so that we can both be aware of it and counter it as well as possibly uh, other things in that, in that field. And as, as I'm sure many are aware, we can, and, and we can tie ourselves into a particular stream of information. I myself am an NPR fan, right? And I, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and I listen to it 24 seven if I could, right? You know, but that's not what everybody would listen to. Um, and so that can necessarily at times make me have to go and look for an alternate source of information, news. Is what's, what I'm hearing here really true? If it makes me have a flag go up, how do I go and do that homework, right? Well, how do you do that for others, especially when you have the choice today to only tie into one stream of information? Uh, and so we're, we're really exploring what the art of the possible is in that space right now. Dr. Tompkins, I know large language models are such an important part of, have become a huge foundational, they're, they're called foundation models often. Mm -hmm. Uh, for other kinds of AI, is that a DARPA um, area of interest as well? From the, is there a sort of blend here? And um... um, well, absolutely. Um, you know, within that group of about 90 program managers, we have, I, I, you know, probably a good dozen that are thinking really hard about problems, both directly and indirectly related to things like large language models. Um, our uh, Information Innovation Office (I2O), which Dr. Dr. Kathleen Fisher runs. Um, just recently completed an AI-focused analytical framework for trying to sit back and take a look at where this problem space is and uh, um, some of the, the problems with uh, the, like the, the data sets that are used for feeding some of those things is, is an area that they're particularly concerned with. 
Can I ask, uh, Lisa, your, um, the kind of historical context of this? I mean, uh, you're right. I'm easily the oldest person on here. And, you know, I uh, look at some of my old colleagues here, <laughs> Admiral Jacoby, and think about the, you know, the early Kremlinology that we did and, uh, you know, understanding the kinds of malinformation that we, uh, I don't know, anecdotally address in the old school ways. But when, when did this become a kind of much more technically addressable challenge? Uh, and, and newer efforts in machine learning were brought to bear. So um, just to sort of comment on the history of IARPA, you know, the first program we ever started was something called Sociocultural Content in Language, if you can believe that mouthful skill. Um, and this was the first BAA we put out, which for a lot of reasons was a big deal at the time. But one of the reasons we were very proud of it was we were asking these kinds of questions before there was, quote, machine learning. I mean, machine learning's been around, but before it became a thing again. And, and you know, both Stephanie and Catherine have hit on the point that there's so much nuance in engagement, even between two individuals when they're talking to each other. Uh, skill was focused on small groups at the time. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, just to take you back to 2008, eight nine time frame, the biggest data set that was available to people to analyze was the Enron data set. For some of you are old enough to remember this and you may have worked in this space, right? Um, so the richness of availability of data to really assess and analyze Lewis, I think is what is, it has been both a challenge but also the opportunity space for IARPA and DARPA to then do more and more. But both organizations were truly pioneers in even asking this question, as you're saying, um, and saying, what do, we, what do we really need to understand about what is being said um, versus the advertisement, I think is what Catherine may have said or Stephanie may have said about you know, what, what is actually being conveyed. Um, we were interested at the time asking questions related to mission-specific challenges around who is the real reader, leader of this group versus perhaps the titular leader, which are often different. Um, is there fractionation occurring in these groups, right? And even back then, just to give a nod again to the forward-leaning tendencies of these groups or these uh, agencies, we were focused on Chinese as well as Arabic. So the intelligence community has always been forward-leaning in understanding that it's not just one culture and one type of people that you need to understand and, and get a better insight into. So there is an upside to having all this data. It has afforded us a lot more opportunity to assess mm -hmm. and evaluate, yeah. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna be combining several questions here, and I wanna ask a forward uh, assessment, thinking about that, that dozen years in which things like GANs were invented and mm -hmm. lots of different things. But if, so if we think ahead, there's uh, many uh, audience members have submitted questions along the lines of, um, where, uh, and we'll start with Lisa, where would you assess uh, U.S. and allies S&T ecosystem compared to that of Russia or China? And um, is there in your mind a kind of most likely potential China breakout technology area that uh, you know, we think about from a, a kind of risk calculation and threat assessment? Uh, so, yeah, I don't like to think about things in terms of technology breakout areas for all the reasons we've just been talking today, which is that really it's a, a system perspective that, that counts. Um, and I think China's been doing a lot of things for a long time. It's not like they woke up two years ago and suddenly decided they wanted to be a global power and presence. Um, uh, President Xi has been very deliberate and interestingly very transparent at the same time about what he's doing. I mean, we watched the buildup of the South China Sea and the islands there for years, and we watched it as an example. Um, we watched how they have grown in influence uh, in, Af in Africa, in South America. I mean, th these are strategic initiatives that have taken them years, frankly, to execute, and we watched. And now we're at a point where we suddenly realize maybe we shouldn't just be watching. We need to ask ourselves, what, what is our goal as a nation? And I think we all, regardless of our independent you know, perspectives and opinions, I think we're all uni unified by the desire to, to, con to continue to see our principles, our values, and our way of life sustain. Um, with, I, I'm, always, I'm always just so impressed by the fact that with less than 5% and closer to 4% of the world's population, we have such an outsized influence 
over the globe in a good way. We, at least I'd like to think that it's in a good way. Um, so when we think about our allies, it's really important to think about them, not as an afterthought, not as an, oh, by the way, you can join our team, but you're a critical part of our principles and our values and our way of life and ensuring that they sustain. So I think as we go forward, we absolutely must think about uh, that teamwork with our allies and partners. And if we do, and we don't get ourselves into a mindset where we start trying to copy China to beat China, which is something that does concern me, um, then I think we're, we'll be in good stead. I, I firmly believe that you know total centralized uh, communist control is not going to win in the long run as long as we stay true to our values and our principles. But we, we can't let fear drive us into behaviors that make us react rather than proactively um, go forward again. So hopefully that answered your question. There's a little less technology and a little more philosophy, but you know, you shouldn't do one without the other, right? At well, least there try there to do can't one. be. Do Dr. Tompkins, so on the technology front, um, on China, the, uh, the kinds of civil military fusion, goal setting, often tied to specific years that, uh, uh, that PRC has uh, laid out publicly. Um, it, it sort of has the flavor of JFK's within a decade will uh, land a, a man on the moon, but it, it does uh, feel uh, quite uh, distinct from our fundamental scientific approach. We're, uh, from a DARPA hat, how do you see the time forward in a sort of competitive landscape? So, you know, I think, I think your point about, you know, the, the man on the moon goal um, is a good one. I mean, it's a very, very focused set of things, transparent. Um, it has been very effective. Our process is much messier. Um, at the same time, when you, when you set yourself out for a very specific and singular goal, I think something everyone has probably realized themselves is you don't tend to look to the left and the right a lot. You look straight ahead because you've got to get there. Within each one of our DARPA programs, that tends to happen too, right? They are focused on the goal, and, and one, of, one of my jobs is to make sure that they aren't so focused on the goal that they ignored the fact that maybe the technology wasn't, you know, they've realized that it's not impossible, but maybe it wasn't as necessary as they thought it was, right? So, so that, I think, is, is one of the really important distinctions, is that when you have an entire nation going, going forward to a very specific set of places, you're probably missing a little bit what's on the left and the right. I, I would certainly argue that um, China might have been a bit surprised by events in recent years, uh, recent months, in yes. fact. Um, and are, are, are scrambling right now to figure out how to, how to deal with that. So I'm, I'm by no means saying one is absolutely better right. than the other. I just completely agree with Lisa that I want to live in the one that we have. Yes. Yes. Um, and, I, and I do worry. I mean, of course I worry sometimes that uh, when it comes to movement forward in, in changing our warfighting principles, we're not moving as quickly um, as we probably could be. And there are certainly bureaucratic things that need to get addressed. Um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily fortunate to work with really, really great people um, across both uh, the uh, Lisa's old job um, <laughs> with, with R&E and with this entire ecosystem that gives me a lot of hope. And, uh, and, and obviously there are other elements of, of what we're working on that we don't talk about publicly, but all of them uh, mm -hmm. um, make me pretty bullish. Good. Yeah. Uh, Do Dr. Marsh, you have a background, long time um, background. Um, in intelligence, and for IARPA, I mean, you have the benefit of being close to the collection side of things. So when, you, do you have a particular lens in thinking about the competitive uh, landscape of, of potential adversary s and the, They're making huge investments, and we are not making enough of an investment in this country. All right, you can get better at anything if you put enough resources into it. I think the thing that we offer to the, we DARPA and IARPA offer is that going out to the nation to bring in these innovative capabilities, to bring that advanced tech in and to get those new players, right? Those program managers who come on board for that three to five years who got that great idea that are wanting to do that, that look across I agree with Stephanie that you, when you're focused this way, you don't, sorry, 
You don't necessarily look to the right and the left and you can miss things. Um, I don't think Russia is making anywhere near the investment that's going on. We see that they're not, okay, in technology that China is. I mean, China has been singularly focused in that area for a long time. They've got a huge initiative to bring quantum supremacy to them, and we worry about that. We as the nation are worried about that. I sit on the subcommittee who uh, worries about that, and how do we ensure that we've got that capability for the nation? It's, it's, so it's making sure that we're smart about what it is they are investing in and where they're going, and watching uh, the, where the papers are. What are they publishing? When did they stop publishing in that area? Why, right? When things go dark, we need to pay more attention. And so that's one of the ways that we can be aware of where there are advances and then uh, pay attention to who, where those are coming from. The other thing I particularly personally worry about is the fact that because they're investing so much that they're taking our best researchers from this nation and so we want to keep them here. We want them to have the investments here so that they stay and that technical advantage stays here so that we can have that unfair technology advantage for the intelligence and the DOD. Okay. Uh, uh, we don't just, sure. Such a good point. You know, there is no DARPA in China. There is no IARPA in China. Uh, I don't think they could do it if they tried. It's not just about money. It's about how you invest the money. Um, my old DARPA boss, DARPA director, Dr. Tether, used to say it's not the size of the budget, it's the size of the idea. And I used to love that expression. Um, and because when you're at DARPA and you're a program manager, you can have a small program in budget and still be one of his or her now favorite programs because of the possible opportunity for disruption. Mm -hmm. I think we do a lot well. I want to echo Stephanie's bullish uh, perspective. I worry about China as do the leaders here. Uh, we should. If we didn't, we would be foolish. But we are not in a position right now where we should throw up our hands and say we can't continue our way of life and continue to succeed. We just have to be vigilant. But I'm, I, I'm always amazed that when I traveled uh, in my prior job uh, to various countries and so forth, everybody wanted a, a DARPA, right? It, DARPA is, is a, and an IARPA now, right? It, it's a very unique kind of construct when you think about what it celebrates, entrepreneurship, risk taking, betting on things that are credible but extraordinarily difficult, uh, reaching out to the best and brightest and recognizing that you are not the smartest in the room but you have an opportunity to manage those who might be. All of those things are uniquely, I would, I would argue, not necessarily just American but certainly Western. And, and I think we, we celebrate that without even realizing it with the success of, of DARPA, which is now, what, 60-something years old, right? And IARPA, when I started it, people were taking bets it was going to last six months to a year. Mm -hmm. ha. So, so those of you who took that bet, ha ha. <laughs> so anyway, I just well, want to end on a positive note on that. In, in, that, in that spirit, let me ask a kind of uh, summary question for each of you then. Um, uh, we had several questions about uh, a variety of tech areas. Uh, one person pointing out that uh, the metaverse uh, is, is becoming a popular buzzword in, in the IC and DOD, a lot of interest. Uh, Space Force has actually, uh, the uh, CTO of Space Force has said she is, quote, all in on the space verse. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to bias your answer. If you had an additional billion dollars to invest in something that might be a particular breakout uh, success area uh, technologically, Dr. Marsh, uh, then Dr. Tompkins, and then Lisa, uh, w if where I would had you a spend billion that? Dollars, yeah. Wow! wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't understand our budget, but that's okay. Uh, uh, an additional uh, billion. But, but, but. Uh, well, actually, one of our programs is, is actually looking into this, the brand new REVA program, which is how do you create those, in the intelligence community, one of the things we have to do before we do a mission is we do, um, we go out and we surveil where we're gonna go to make sure that what we're doing, we're not being tailed or tracked or, or something like that. And so, but with the threat of ubiquitous technical surveillance, cameras are everywhere, mm. right? They catch you, right? You're so, you're, if you're wearing a Fitbit, it's watching you as it pings off all those cell phone towers and tells you everywhere you've gone, right? Which is great if you're counting steps, but you know, it's not 
not so great if you are trying to do uh, what we do in, in the intelligence community. So how can you do that, right, and create those environments so that you can do those detection surveillance capabilities in those places where um, we need to be? Right, and so we've got a program that's targeting that in, in being able to create those alternate uh, worlds and go out and do that exploration. Not somewhere like Paris, because you could probably do that with what's already commercially available, but in those areas of the world where the intelligence community is going out to do some of the things that we have to do. It's really hard. Right? when you don't have a lot of data and you want to create that and you want it to be real and you want to engage with it. And so um, keeping that going and making it be so that it's real is not, not easy. And so more in that area, more in that area where we have really solid data that we've got that can enable that. You can't have those alternate uh, realities without making sure that you understand where the edges of those capabilities are. And, and I, I think we're just in that nascent field of understanding that. Dr. Tompkins, a, a congressional ad of a billion with nothing <laughs> tied to it, where would you place that? <laughs> I, would, I would focus it on scaling and on transition. So um, we had a fascinating panel at the last DARPA Forward Conference focusing on systems. And we had a lot of folks who, who were dealing with everything from autonomous systems to swarms of autonomous systems. And the, the universal thing that all of them agreed was there is just never enough time to do the testing, the evaluation, and the feedback to the modeling and simulation you need for the level of complexity that we're operating in this world. So clearly there are things I can do with the funding I have, which is to invest in technology programs that do focus on kind of the science of scaling, but what we really need is more time, more money, more, more sort of field, field testing to really get out there and hash this out. Um, and then we also live in a world where you know, the ecosystem, DARPA has, has just, I mean, I'm so grateful for the support that we get um, across the board. We are given you know, a, a big budget, we're given a lot of autonomy. A lot of our partners don't have that level of autonomy and flexibility and resources. So we often have to reach further and further out, even than we might have done a decade ago, in order to, to meet them halfway in getting technology transitioned to them. So the ability for us to carry it a little further, to do the additional testing that helps convince their leadership that the time is ripe to take on a new DARPA, crazy DARPA technology, those are the things that, that keep me up at night, and that's that's an easy answer. Um, we know exactly where we would put that. But just Excellent. building on that, to do that field testing and keep it robust uh, is extraordinarily expensive. And, and, it's, and so we're going out to do some flight testing next week, and one of the radar systems just crashed yesterday, mm. right? So how do you, not, not fun, but reality. And so having that infrastructure so that you've got that feedback loop, I need to footstamp that. It's That's really good. important. Science is messy and expensive. Lisa, final thought on that? Yeah, I would start my own fund. No, I am just kidding. Um, I, I, would, I don't want to be redundant. I think Stephanie and um, Catherine have made the point, and it's really what I led with. This is what I meant by really making sure we are pay, paying attention to system engineering and building resilience in our systems. We cannot do that on PowerPoint. We can't do that if we're staying in a lab. Um, it is extraordinarily more expensive to scale. Uh, when we stood up the 5G effort, and Stephanie, you may remember that because DARPA helped me do that, frankly. Um, we thought about that from the beginning. We said 5G doesn't make any sense in a lab. We don't even know what that means when you talk about ubiquitous connectivity and you're limiting it to a little experiment. So we intentionally said we've got to do experimentation at scale. And that kind of budget was you know, on the order of a billion over a few years, right, give or take. So it, it is, to, to both Catherine and Stephanie's point, it is far more expensive to test things deliberately, uh, rigorously, um, at scale, but it's absolutely essential if we're really gonna get after resilience in our system. So yeah. yes, that's, I think we are all in, in violent agreement on, on what we need to see more of. A great note to end on. This has been extraordinary. Obviously, we could use a lot more time for this. Thank you so much to all three of you, and thanks to the audience. Thank Let's you. give them a round of applause.